I remember the first time that being a human being scared me. I was about six years old, and I met a man who had had a stroke and was half paralyzed. And I was told that he hadn't always been that way. He'd been normal. And then all of a sudden one day, half his body he couldn't use. I remember a sense of horror, not so much at the man himself, but the, the horror that it could happen to me. And John Lee and Ginnana Yon talk about the same sort of thing. In Ginnana Yon's case, it was when one of her younger siblings was born. She saw all the, the pain that her mother went through, and she had to leave the house. And same with the John Lee, he saw all the pain that his the women in the village went through as they were giving birth. He had to run away. It's good to reflect on these things. Here we are in a human birth, and it's not a very secure place to be. So we want to find a way out if we want to find any real security or real happiness. This is why we meditate, because we believe in the power of the mind to find happiness that's more than ordinary. So you try to use these thoughts not to get you discouraged, but to actually encourage you to practice. That's the use of heedfulness. That's the use of Reflection of death, recollection of death, is going to happen to us all. And if we can re recollect death in a way that makes us heedful, okay, that's an auspicious thing. In Thailand, there's a, a textbook that they use for the Dhamma exams for lay people. It divides the types of ceremonies that you would have into two sorts those that are auspicious and those that are inauspicious. The inauspicious ones all have to do with death. As with that chant we did just now, that's a chant that's usually chanted at somebody's death. But that's not a Buddhist idea. It's more of a Brahmanical idea. That anything associated with death is inauspicious. If you can reflect on death in a way that makes you hateful, then it becomes auspicious. In fact, that's the recollection the Buddha has you think about when you see somebody's died. He said, this body too, such is its unavoidable fate. We didn't have to see it. Dead body, you just think about the fact that there's death. We read about death every day in the news. The numbers vary. But a day doesn't go by without somebody dying. As a matter of fact, quite a few people dying. They say on an average it's 200,000 people a day. So it's all around us, which means that we should be very heedful. Heedful in our virtue, heedful in our concentration, heedful in our discernment. Heedful in virtue means that we realize that whatever we might gain by even the slightest infraction of the precepts is not worth it. That those little gains just got washed away, and then you're left with the karma. Heedful in your concentration means that you're trying to be as careful as possible in getting the mind to settle down. Being alert, mindful, ardent. Not just getting the mind to be still, but watching the mind as it stills down. So 
So you can begin to understand when the mind does leave the topic of concentration, even if just for a moment, how does it do that? Here you are, you've made the intention to stay with your breath. You work with the breath, get familiar with the breath, try to make the breath comfortable so that it's a good place to stay. Yet the mind will still wander off. Why is that? How does it do that? What are the stages? There are psychologists who say they've studied brain patterns and they can tell that when a person has made a decision, often it, the decision has been made a little bit before the person is aware of it. Now their conclusion is that we have no free will, that somehow the brain makes the decision and then we lie to ourselves that we've made the decision ourselves. But I think another kind of lying is going on. The decision was made when the mind likes to cover things up from itself. Part of it knows the decision was made. And then it's just waiting for the opportunity to slip out. But can you catch it? Can you catch that little moment of the mind where it makes the decision and then pretends that it didn't? It's like that dog we used to have, oh, it It was a very clever dog. It would come up in the evening when the monks were having their, their evening allowables. And it would scratch your leg. And then as you look down, it would look away, pretend that it hadn't done it. And then if you ignored it, it would scratch your leg again. There are layers to the mind. And the purpose of concentration is being able to see through those layers. And that's what it means to be heedful in your concentration. Heedful in your discernment means that when an insight comes, you can't just accept it at face value. You've seen so many cases of people who've come to false conclusions that they're awakened. So as we said earlier today, you learn from other people's mistakes. You've got to watch yourself. When an insight arises, how does the mind respond? What's its immediate reaction? And John Lee says that he gives two pieces of advice. One is, when you gain an insight, ask yourself, to what extent is the opposite true? As the Buddha pointed out, there are many things that are true, but they're not necessarily beneficial. And this may not be the right time and place for them. So to check whether they're beneficial and whether it's the right time or place, ask yourself, to what extent is the opposite of that insight true? The second piece of advice, he says, is wherever there's truth, there's going to be falseness as a shadow. Once you place a stamp on something as 100% true, something false has already slipped in. So you have to be careful about your insights. Because after all, if you're not careful, they're not going to be safe. They're going to lead you to do things and say things and think things that are going to be dangerous. So you want to be careful all around. This is a quality that many of John Munn's students said they noticed in him. They'd had set their minds on doing something and they thought they were 100% good, and he would find something wrong. An angle from which they hadn't looked, an angle that they hadn't considered. Or you think about the Buddha. They called him the all-around eye. He saw things from every angle. And that's how he was able to make himself 100% safe. So you want to see the dangers in birth, the dangers in becoming. Be alive to those dangers, but don't be overwhelmed by them. The whole point of heedfulness is not that you just you 
give up in the face of dangers. In fact, it's the opposite of giving up in the face of dangers. The other part of heedfulness is there is an escape, and it can be done through your actions. When we take on right view, remember it is a view, it's not right knowledge yet. There are a lot of aspects of a right view that the Buddha can't prove to you ahead of time. But he does offer in two ways a kind of pragmatic proof. One is if you adopt certain views, such as the view that you do have the power of choice. And the results of your actions are going to depend on the intention behind the action. And that these results can last not only through this time, lifetime, but also into future lifetimes. The first test is that if you adopt this view, you're more likely to behave in a skillful way than if you adopted its opposite. If you believe you had no choice, you would just go with whatever came into the mind. The second proof is, if you believe in the possibility that there is a path that leads to awakening, that leads to the end of becoming, that opens more possibilities for what you could achieve in terms of real happiness than if you assume that there was no such thing as awakening or the end of becoming. At the very least, if you open the possibility. It could happen. If you close your mind to the possibility, there's no way it's going to happen. So in a way, adopting right view is a gamble. But you look around and there are really no other good alternatives. No inspiring alternatives, no noble alternatives. This is how you're heedful in your discernment. And it's through heedfulness that you provide yourself with safety. As the Buddha said, all skillful qualities are rooted in heedfulness. It's not that we're innately good, and then it's, at the same time it's not that we're innately bad. But our actions depend on a calculation. Is it going to be worth the effort? And the more you believe in your power of action, and the more you believe you, you'd notice the dangers that come from acting unskillfully. the more your calculations will lead you to stay on the path.